Duff F5. Um, I can't tell you the serial number, but it's a pretty early one. 027. I think it's a 1995, if I recall. Anyway, I've had a couple of Duffs in the shop, and <clears throat> they're top drawer mandolins, you know. They use they sell used for anywhere from six to eight thousand dollars, made in Australia. Uh, what else about it? I did a Evo refret on it. So the frets were kind of worn and they were a little bit fatter and everything. I did a full Evo refret. It's in another video of mine where I talk about the mandolin, uh, the fingerboard radius of the mandolins. And this is the same duff that's in there. I just thought I'd give it a more um, thorough review, you know. Uh, the workmanship on it is really, really good. You know, I mean, as you expect from a top floor mandolin, it's, you know, beautiful binding. Got a nice uh, flower pot on the headstock. Uh, the one thing I found funny about it, I'm not sure if these tuners have ever been replaced or if they're the stock tuners, but the buttons on these two right here are really close to the headstock. I mean, they are hitting the headstock right there. You see that? And it makes it, um, it, makes it hard to turn. I mean, it literally actually hits the corner of the headstock right there. There's a little bit of dent on both of them. <clears throat> That's kind of funny. I felt that immediately when I put when I went to get the tuner. I'm like, wow, that's close, you know. And you can't get a string winder on there because you're going to hit the headstock. So that's just an odd thing. I'm not sure why that's so. Uh, but otherwise, man, it's got a nice neck. It's not a nice smooth taper, um, you know, which is a really big deal for me. I talk about it all the time. I, I can't stand fat tapers like this. And I really on a mandolin. I really can't stand a C-shaped thing where it gets fatter up here and fat down here. Uh, I played a lot of, of really good mandolins that have that kind of neck. Uh, this one doesn't have that at all. This one's really nice and smooth. It's got kind of a round V to it. It's a little bit on the chunky side as far as the neck goes, which is fine, you know. I like a little bit of a heftier neck on a mandolin. Great neck. The binding is really nice. It's really, really well finished mandolin. Uh, beautiful back. And, uh, gosh, it's good. You know what, I, I think this is one of the best tailpieces I've ever seen. I really like this style of tailpiece. And what's cool about it, it's got this little door, and you twist this knob, and the door will pop open like this. Now, if you pay attention to this, you see how the strings come up off of the tailpiece? So if this tailpiece is down, the strings are going to come up off of it. And if the tailpiece happens to be up a little bit like this, you got to watch that. You don't want the strings pulling down on it, you see. So you always want to have a little bit of clearance under here. Like that. I've had other tailpieces similar to this. Um, if this tailpiece angle happened to come up like this, to where the strings are pulling down, you can collapse the top. I had that happen to my Elkhorn mandolin. After a couple of years, or after I uh, made adjustments to it and put lower frets on it and dropped the action and reseated the bridge, the action, you know, the strings came down and it turned out that the tailpiece was pushing down on the top right here, like this, you see. And that puts a lot of stress on the front right here. And 
the mandolin happened to have a different kind of curve to the top. I showed it to Tom Ellis, and we talked about it a little bit. And he pointed out the curve on the top, and, and anyway, all that combination of everything caused a crack in the top right there. So if you have a tailpiece like this, a cast tailpiece, watch to make sure that your strings aren't pushing down on the front of that tailpiece. Uh, but this is just a cool tailpiece. It's got the strings are nice and are staggered like this, which is neat. And the tops of the posts have little um, rings in them, indentations, relief things. So you put the string in there and it sticks, it stays. It doesn't go popping off the post like a lot of them do. You shut the little door like that and twist the knob. I got to put a little pressure on it to push it against the felt. And that is just a cool tailpiece. That's one of the best tailpiece designs I've ever seen, I think. One of my favorite. Otherwise, it's an X brace mandolin, and I was reaching in there for the X's on the other video, and the owner said, I suspected it might be an X, and the owner told me, yeah, it's an X brace, and so I stuck a mirror in there finally, and sure enough, it is an X brace. It used to have a pick guard on it, and the owner took it off, and you can see his wear marks from his fingers. What I found about playing this mandolin, um, after I sat here and played it for quite a while, is I'm used to to drag my finger and used to having a pick guard. I'll show you my Chris shot. I'm used to having a pick guard right here. And due to the radius of the fingerboard, where I talked about this in another video, the, ra the radius is really sharp. It's a full, like a four inch radius here. The bridge has to sort of match that. It's got a strong radius. So your hand has to kind of go like this. Therefore, I found out when I was playing it that if I try to drag my finger like this, that's what throws me off because my finger wants to go more straight. So anyway, I started playing with just a closed floating right hand and I got along so much better with it, you know. Like that. And to me, that was just very natural, um, easy, instinctive. I always use the word instinctive because that's what I want. I don't want to have to think about the, the playing part. It should be there. And when I, when I did that with the right hand, wow, just everything improved. So, it's just a comment, you know. Gosh, it's a good sound of mandolin. And the other duff I did belonged to Joe Carr, um, who used to teach at South Plains College. And I refretted his mandolin with the Euro fret wire many years ago, maybe 10 years ago even. So, I think this is only maybe the second duff I've, I've had in the shop. Great mandolin, you know. I'm going to compare it to my Chris Shot mandolin over here because the two of them are X braced. Both of them are X braced. And I'm not really trying to compare them for a better or worse or anything. I'm just trying to show you where this mandolin stands or how does it sound in the, you know, in the hierarchy of mandolins. I use my Chris Shot generally as my, you know, standard comparison mandolin. I'm not saying it's the best mandolin in the world or anything like that. It's just a standard that all the other mandolins compare to. A lot of them are better than it, but it's, you know, um, let's see how they sound. So let's do an AB on this mandolin and the Chris shop. And then this one's gonna get boxed up and uh, headed home after I check, make sure I got all the frets right. Because it was a little bit of a difficult fret job since I couldn't press the frets in. Pressing is, gives you such a much more consistent fret job when you got to tap them in, um, you know, the fret will have all, just all these little micro things that you got to work on. And on a mandolin, micro adjustment is the key. Everything has to be so extremely precise if you want to have a, a nice, low, smooth action, no buzzes anywhere, easy to play, instinctive. I also did a nut on this mandolin. The stock spacing uh, was pretty far off on a couple of these strings, and that's very common. When I first started uh, working on things, especially mandolins, uh, I'd go around and measure every mandolin that I get my hands on. I'd go to IBMA, um, big places like you know Winfield, um, Merle Fast, places where there might be a lot of mandolins. And I took my calipers and field gauges and I measured all kinds of mandolins. And I found out that the nut spacing <laughs> It was really hard for a lot of people to get most very consistent. Nowadays, of course, people have C&C, &C, and so like Ellis mandolins, when I was talking to Tom about this, 
Uh, you know, there you see and see the cutterman, so they get extremely consistent results. But back in the day, back in 2000, the most consistent uh, Gilchrist. Man, the Gilchrist man lens, I measured like five or six of them at IBMA. <laughs> they, were, they were precise. And uh, and uh, Stephen was there, and, and uh, you know, he kind of laughed when he saw me doing that. Because, yeah, you know, he'd been down that road too, so... So I, uh, I made a new nut out of a fossil walrus ivory. I don't like working with, with pearl. Pearl, um, pearl dust can be extremely toxic, and I just don't like working with pearl. <laughs> Try to avoid it if I can, but it's fossil walrus ivory, which is good stuff. And then over with the bridge, I respaced all the strings here too. And again, the distance between these two was farther apart. The distance in between the pairs was, you know, a little, a little, off here and there. So I took a lot of time to get all these strings, even distance in between here, even here, even here, very even spacing. To me, all that does is it gets the more, um, makes the man a little more instinctive, which is what I'm always looking for. I'm looking for instinctive to where you're not thinking about it. And sometimes you're, oh, I'm sloppy. Yeah, sometimes that sloppiness is due to a lack of instinctiveness on the mandolin or the guitar mandolin setup. So. Okay, let's do an A-B between this mandolin and my Kershaw. <clears throat> 